very good evening to all of you. Uh, this topic is uh, very different from what we just heard from Professor. And what I am going to do now is take you through something which is very close to my heart on the relationship between business and government. Uh, before I begin, uh, let me also share with you or tell you what is the objective of business. I think the objective of business is to make money. When we look at organizations, I do not think we set up organizations to make losses. I think the fundamental objective is to make money. But more than that, I think it should be long term sustainable. An organization has to sustain it itself over a longer period of time. And I think from that perspective, when you look at making money, it is one aspect. But there are many other aspects that come into it around it for an organization to be successful. So the next question that comes to our mind is, what is success? And I think one important uh, distinction that we need to make is that success can have different measurements. In an organization like the corporate world, uh, we measure success by EBITDA, what we call as the net profit. It could be competition in terms of market share, how we are placed. It could be based on our liquidity ratios. It could be based on how much growth we are expecting over time. And I think there could be several measures of success. But at the same time, uh, I came across a nice uh, quotation which says that success uh, does not depend on numbers. And this is an important uh, uh, thinking that I, I strongly believe is success is not determined only by numbers. So while I say on the one side profitability or uh, in other words uh, when you want to really make an organization successful, so what that means is it has to be success of the enterprise in itself and it is just not numbers. But when we look at uh, the world over us from the last decade, we have had uh, several failures. Uh, the failures could be in terms of not understanding risk. More so, I would say, uh, the failures because of top management fraud. And a, a very single uh, example that I would give you would be of Enron in the last decade, where uh, because of what happened in Enron, uh, the entire system collapsed. Everybody got uh, very concerned about why this thing happened in corporate America. And Corporate America was known to have good systems and processes in place. So when Enron happened, we had lot many regulations coming in. But Enron was not the only one. We didn't stop with Enron. And uh, what followed was WorldCom. And I, I often believe that um, WorldCom, very simply put, what they did was, you know, whatever was uh, typically revenue in nature, they tried to capitalize it so that you, you have a much better profitability in the books. And that is the only thing that uh, they did. But the fact of the matter is that Enron and WorldCom and many others that followed, if you see the chart here, the NASDAQ actually, the, sense like the NASDAQ index actually crashed when you had a series of failures in, corporate, uh, in the corporate world. But if you see some of the other ones, uh, for example, Parmalat in Italy was also a very large organization. And it collapsed because of dubious practices and very indifferent, probably audit procedures. And one example I could give you was there was a $5 billion deposit lying in one of the banks, which when the external auditors had to verify the existence of the deposit, primarily relied on a fax documentation. And actually that $5 billion deposit was not there at all. So the question is that it is true that when management tries to cheat, uh, it is very difficult to uh, you know, uh, think how they would have done it, at the same time try to detect it in time. But the role, what I am trying to say is that when we see these organizing, uh, organizations around us fall by the wayside, there must be something that causes this condition. And closer home, when Satyam happened, all of you would have heard about Satyam when Ramalinga Raju, the chairman, sent out the letter to the stock exchange on January 7, 2009, 
saying that he can't take it anymore. It was a real, uh, I would say, a watershed in corporate India. And everybody started working around it to find out why Satyam failed. And Satyam was the fourth largest you know, IT company in India at that point in time. And I think one of the reasons that happened in Satyam was there was a top management fraud. And I think in that sense, it's an aberration as far as I'm concerned. It's an aberration to what we are doing in corporate India. Not every company is Satyam, but there's always this feeling that because Satyam happened, we need to take some strong measures. So when Enron happened, the unfortunate element in that is it killed uh, two birds with one stone. Enron collapsed in a month's time, and so did Arthur Anderson. Now, Arthur Anderson was one of the most uh, reputed and well-known accounting and audit firms, and that collapsed along with it because of one instance of uh, risk that probably Anderson took while doing the audit of Enron. And why did this happen in Enron? Is because Enron was, again, looking after numbers. And that comes to the original thought that I had, that it's just not about numbers. So Enron was trying to inflate, was always trying to keep up to market so that its stocks are always priced well, and then did not know how to come over that crisis. So if you have to see what happened to the regulation after this, in many places, there was a panic. And in the US, they came up with a very big law called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002. So the Enron happened in 2001. And immediately after that, Sarbanes-Oxley came in. Likewise, in many other uh, countries, you had JSOX known in, in Japan, and then you had the other countries in Canada and other places. So regulation became uh, the order of the day. And in India as such, if you notice, uh, the, the Confederation of Indian Industry came up with a code in 1996. And prior to that, in the UK, we have had several committees going in through, like the, the Cadbury Committee and others, on governance. Uh, but the CIA code followed by the Kumar Mangalam Birla Committee, which finally came into law under Clause 49 under the listing agreement. And this required many things to be done from audit committee, directors, and things like that. But this is one aspect of governance that came, became law. But the question I always raise is that if we are looking at why these things happened, then a, th there is actually a clear indication that uh, governance is a key to success. And I would say, while you need good leadership, you need a great vision, you need uh, thinking, you need long-term vision, you need to have a great team to manage the business, all those are there, very well understood. But at the end of the day, you need good governance. Now, what does it mean by governance? So governance is basically a set of uh, processes, systems, principles that ensure that the company is governed in the best interest for all its stakeholders. Now, stakeholders is anybody who has a stake in the company. And that could be employees, it could be vendors, it could be customers, it could be the government itself, as also it could be uh, the, the society. So I think one of the uh, ways of looking at corporate governance is we say that there are four pillars, which says oh, you have the board on one side, uh, you have the management on the other side, you have an internal auditor on one side and an external auditor on the other side. And there has to be an interplay between all these people to ensure that there is appropriate transparency fairness, accountability, and responsibility, which are actually the four tenets of governance. So regardless of whatever structure you may have, it is important to ensure that these four tenets are embedded in the system uh, for any organization. So I would look at it this way that corporate governance cannot always be regulated. It is not in any organization or any country to say that I will regulate governance completely. It just doesn't happen. The way I look at governance is that it is something that is deep within an organization. So when you're all you know, students, uh, we're always asked to produce a character certificate in school and college so that this person bears a good moral character. So I would say the same thing should apply to an organization. So if an organization has to have character, then it must imbibe in its values. It must have a clear vision a mission statement. And I think over time, it has to build a good culture within the organization. And culture is something where it killed. Many of these organizations did not have the right culture. So I always see culture when I walk into an office. 
when I see the reception, I know what culture is there. So there are times when, uh, uh, you know, regardless of whether it is professionally managed or family managed businesses, there is always something that is very difficult to see. So culture is something which is actually an intangible, but to my mind, the most important in any organization which will actually look at success. So the larger companies in India today, if you look at Infosys, the Tata's, the Wipro's, they've had built great culture. So, uh, and that is one reason why the stock market would also give them that kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the recognition because it has a good culture. Because there is then, if you have a good culture, it basically means that the chances of success is much higher. So I think in a sense, I would say that governance should become the DNA of the organization, the culture, the way they actually respect people, the way they respect their uh, vendors, their employees. Very often in businesses, we always treat, we say the customer is king, but the vendor is always given a second fiddle. So there are many organizations which give vendors also the equal partnership. And so with the result, if you treat your vendor or a customer like a true partner, that builds up confidence in the system. So I think, as I said, that this has to be built in the character of the organization. And I also strongly believe that because of one satyam, nothing is lost. Uh, it's an aberration to all of us. But in India, uh, if you know the Satyam episode, there were a four or five agencies that went into it, right, from the different, uh, not only the ministry, but also the CBI and many others. But it's a great uh, story that we are able to turn around that company and somebody is able to, we are able to auction it and buy it. Uh, that's a great thing that happened. But for example, Enron failed. They all filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and uh, WorldCom also failed. So at least we have a good story here that the government woke up. But the only danger is that they may try to do something different and what I call as a knee-jerk reaction. Very often when we look at averages, we normally take out the outliers. The averages, individual data that is lying outside of the system is normally to be ignored. And, when, and, and, and I do believe that Satyam was an aberration and we should not think that Satyam should drive uh, government policy. So I think in a way, I do believe that as we go forward, there is something called integration. Uh, worldwide, the way I have seen is that you have something called governance, risk management, and compliance being integrated. So we are calling as this, this as the GRC framework, and this is not something new. It is already there across, but more and more companies are trying to adopt this to say, on the one side, we have governance. The other is risk management. Risk management is basically trying to determine what risk the organization is facing and whether I'm actually recognizing risk and managing risk effectively. So many of the financial companies that failed in the last year, in, in 2008, is because they, they did not understand what is the risk appetite of the organization, how much risk they can take. And that's why sometime when the bubble bursts, you just go down under. So risk management is very important from that perspective. And of course, compliance is because you're looking at are you ethically uh, conscious of your responsibility, do you comply with laws of the land, both internal and external? I think that's very important as we go forward. The risk lies everywhere, but it is true that this would get somewhat integrated. And as of today, we see many organizations using the GRC model for companies. And I think that's very important that uh, this, take, this is not just a new approach, but this is something that many organizations have already absorbed and they're trying to do it. And many of them are doing it on a um, using computer. But one thing I would always say is there is no such thing as you have an automated control, but there is no such thing as automated culture. So culture has to be, you know, brought out. It has to be imbibed and somebody has to lead that culture. And we have great examples in India of leadership, which has got great culture. And if you lead by example, that culture would actually get entwined. It will get imbibed. It will percolate down the line. I think that's very important. And uh, the organization that I work for talks about the Institute of Internal Auditors and they strongly believe that good governance is good business. Thank you very much.